It might have been Club Justine, or Jim Bowes, or Sad Jacks, or the Rafters. Coretti had never been sure where he'd first seen her. At any time, she might have been in any of those bars. She swam through the submarine half-life of bottles and glassware and the slow swirl of cigarette smoke. She moved through a natural element, one bar after another. And now Coretti remembered their first meeting as if he saw it through the wrong end of a powerful telescope, small and clear and very far away. He had noticed her first in the back door lounge. It was called the back door because you entered through a narrow back alley. The alley's walls crawled with graffiti. Its cage lights ticked in moths, and flakes from its white painted bricks crunched underfoot. And then you pushed through into a dim space inhabited by a faintly confusing sense of half a dozen other bars that had tried and failed in the same room under different managements. Coretti sometimes went there because he liked the weary smile of the bartender and because the few customers rarely tried to get chummy. He wasn't very good at conversation with strangers, not at parties and not in bars. He was fine at the community college where he lectured on introductory linguistics. He could talk with the head of his department about sequencing and options and conversational openings, but he could never talk to strangers and bars or parties. He didn't go to many parties, but he went to a lot of bars. Creddy didn't know how to dress. Clothing was a language, and Coretti, a kind of a sartorial stutterer, unable to make the kind of basic, coherent fashion statements that would put strangers at ease. His ex-wife told me to dress like a Martian. They didn't look as though he belonged anywhere in the city. He hadn't liked her saying that because it was true. He hadn't ever had a girl like the one who sat with her back arched, slightly in the undersea light that splashed along the bar in the back door. The same light was screwed into the lenses of the bartender's glasses, wound into the necks of the rows of bottles, splashed dully across the mirror. In that light, her dress was the green of young corn, like a husk half stripped away, showing back and a lot of thigh through the slits of the sides. Her hair was coppery that night, and that night, her eyes were green. He pushed resolutely between the empty chrome and formica tables until he reached the bar, where he ordered a straight bourbon. He took off his duffel coat and wound up holding it on his lap while he sat down on one stool from her. Great, he screamed to himself. She'll think you're hiding. And he was startled to realize that he wanted to hide. He studied himself in the mirror behind the bar. A thirty-ish man with thinning dark hair and a pale narrow face on a long neck. Too long for the open collar of the nylon shirt printed with engravings of 1910 automobiles in three vivid colors. He wore a tie with a broad maroon and black diagonals. Too narrow, he supposed, for what he now saw as the grotesquely long point of his collar. It wasn't the wrong color, it was something. Beside him, in the dark clarity of the mirror, the green-eyed woman looked like Irma de Deuce. But looking closer, studying her face, he shivered. A face like an animal's. A beautiful face, but simple, cunning, two-dimensional. And when she senses you're looking at her, Coretti thought, she'll give you the smile, disdainful amusement, or whatever you'd expected. Coretti blurted. May, may, I buy you a, may I buy you a drink? In moments like these, Coretti was possessed by an agonizingly stiff, schoolmasterish linguistic tick. Um, he winced. Um. You would, um, like to buy me a drink? Why, well, how kind of you. She stared, astonishing him. That would be very nice. Distantly, 
He noticed that her reply was as stilted and insecure as his own. She added, Tom Collins on this occasion would be lovely. On this occasion, lovely. Rattled, Coretti ordered two drinks and paid a woman in jeans and an embroidered cowboy shirt bellied up to the bar beside him and asked the bartender for change. Well, hey, she said. And then she strutted to the jukebox and punched for Conway and Loretta's You're the reason our kids are ugly. And Coretti turned to the woman in green and murmured haltingly. Do you enjoy country western music? He groaned secretly at the phrasing and tried to smile. Yes, indeed, she answered. I sure do. The faintest twang edging in her voice. And the cowgirl sat down beside him and asked her, winking, This little terrier here giving you a hard time? And the animal-eyed lady in green replied, Oh no, honey, I got an eye on him, and laughed. Just the right amount of a laugh. The part of Coretti that was dialectologist stirred uneasily, too perfect to shift in phrasing and inflectron. An actress? A talented mimic. The word mimetic rose suddenly in his mind, and he pushed it aside to study her reflection in the mirror. The rows of bottles occluded her, like a gown of glass. The name's Coretti, he said, his verbal poltergeist shifting abruptly, a total unconvincing tough guy mode. Michael Coretti. A pleasure, she said, too softly for the other woman to hear. And again, she had slipped into the lame parody of Emily Post. Conway and Loretta, said the cowgirl to no one in particular. Antoinette, said the woman in green, and inclined her head. She finished her drink, pretended to glance at a watch, said thank you for the drink too, in a polite fashion, and left. And ten minutes later, Coretti was following her down Third Avenue. He had never followed anyone in his life, and it both frightened and excited him. Forty feet seemed a discreet distance, but what should he do if she happened to glance over her shoulder? Third Avenue wasn't a dark street, and it was there in the light of a street lamp, like a stage light, that she began to change. The street was deserted. She was crossing the street. She stepped off the curb, and it began. It began with tints in her hair at first. He thought they were reflections, but there was no neon there to cast the blobs of color that appeared. Colors sliding and merging like oil slicks. Then the colors bled away, and in three seconds she was a white blonde. He was sure it was a trick of the light until her dress began to writhe, twisting across her body like shrink-wrapped plastic. Part of it fell away entirely and lay in curling shreds on the pavement, shed like the skin of some fabulous animal. And when Coretti passed, it was a green foam, fizzing, dissolving, gone. He looked back up at her, and the dress was another dress, green satin, shifting with reflections. Her shoes had changed too. Her shoulders were bare except for thin straps that crossed at the small of her back. Her hair had become short, spiky. He found that he was leaning against a jeweler's plate glass window, his breath coming ragged and harsh with the damp of the autumn evening. He heard the disco's heartbeat from two blocks away. And as she neared it, her movement began suddenly to take on a new rhythm, a shift in emphasis in the sway of her hips, and the way she put her head down on the sidewalk. The doorman let her pass with a vague nod. He stopped Coretti and stared at his driver's license and frowned at his duffel coat. Coretti anxiously scanned the wash of lights at the top of a milky plastic stairway beyond the doorman. She had vanished there, and robotic flashing and redundant thunder. Grudgingly, the man let him pass, and he pounded up the stairs, his haste disturbing the light beneath the translucent plastic steps. Coretti had 
never been in a disco before. He found himself in an environment designed for complete satisfaction and distraction. He waited nervously through the motion and the fashions and the mechanical urban chants booming from the huge speakers. He sought her, almost blindly, on the posed clotted dance floor amid strobe lights, and found her at the bar, drinking a tall, lurid cooler, listening to a young man who wore a loose shirt of pale silk and very tight black pants. She nodded at what Coretti took to be an appropriate interval. Coretti ordered by pointing at a bottle of bourbon. He drank five of the tall drinks and then followed the young man to the dance floor. She moved in perfect accord with the music, striking a series of poses. She went through the entire prescribed sequence, gracefully but not artfully, fitting it perfectly. Always, always fitting in perfectly. Her companion danced mechanically, moving through the ritual with effort. When the dance ended, she turned abruptly and dived into the thick of the crowd. The shrifting throng closed about her like something molten. Coretti plunged in after her, his eyes never leaving her, and he was the only one to follow her change. By the time she reached the stair, she was auburn-haired, wore a long blue dress. A white flower blossomed in her hair, behind her right ear, and her hair was longer and straighter now. Her breasts had become slightly larger and her hips a shade heavier. She took the stairs two at a time, and he was afraid for her then. All those drinks, but the alcohol seemed to have had no effect on her at all. Never taking his eyes off her, Coretti followed. His heart beat, outspeeding the disco throb at his back, sure that at any moment she would turn, glare at him, and call for help. And two blocks down, third, she turned in at Lothario's. There was something different in her step now. Lothario's was a quiet of complex rooms hung with ferns and art deco mirrors. There were fake Tiffany lamps hanging from the ceiling, alternating with wooden bladed fans that rotated too slowly to stir the whiffs of smoke, drifting through the consciously mellow drone of conversation. And after the disco, Lothario's was familiar and comforting a jazz pianist in pinstripe shirt sleeves and loosely knotted tie competed softly with talk and laughter from a dozen tables. And again, she was at the bar. The stools were only half taken, but Coretti chose a wall table in the shadow of a miniature palm, and he ordered once again a bourbon. He drank the bourbon and ordered another. He couldn't feel the alcohol much tonight. She sat beside a young man, yet another young man with the usual set of bland, regular features. He wore a yellow golf shirt and pressed jeans. Her hip was touching his a little. They didn't seem to be speaking, but Coretti felt they were somehow communing. They were leaning toward one another, slightly silent. Coretti felt odd. He went to the restroom and splashed his face with water. Coining back, he managed to pass within three feet of them. Their lips didn't move till he was within earshot. They took turns murmuring realistic pavilion. Saw his earlier films, but... But he's rather self-indulgent, don't you think? Sure, but in that sense that... And for the first time, Coretti knew what they were, what they must be. They were the kind you see in bars who seem to have grown there, who seem genuinely at home there, not drunks, but human fixtures, functions of the bar, the belonging kind. Something in him yearned for a confrontation. He reached this table but found himself unable to sit. He turned, took a deep breath, and walked woodenly toward the bar. He wanted to tap her on the smooth shoulder and ask who she was and exactly what she was, and point out the cold irony of the fact that it was he, Coretti, the Martian dresser, the eavesdropper, the outsider, 
the one whose clothes and conversation never fit, who would at last guess their secret. But his nerve broke, and he merely took a seat beside her and ordered a bourbon. But don't you think that it's all relative? The two seats beyond her companion were quickly taken by a couple who were talking politics. Antoinette in the golf shirt took up the political theme seamlessly, recycling, speaking just loudly enough to be overheard. Her face as she spoke was expressionless, a bird trilling on a limb. She sat so easily on her stool, as if it were a nest, and golf shirt paid for the drinks. He always had the exact change unless he wanted to leave the tip, and Coretti watched them work their way methodically. Through six cocktails, like insects feeding on nectar, but their voices never grew louder, and their cheeks didn't redden. When at last they stood, they moved without a trace of drunkenness, a weakness, thought Coretti, a gap in the camouflage. They paid him absolutely no attention while he followed them through the three successive bars. Then they entered Waylands. They metamorphosed so quickly that Coretti had trouble following the stages of the change. It was one of those places with toilet doors marked pointers and setters. A little imitation pine plaque over the jars of beef jerky and pickled sausages. We've got a deal with the bank. They don't serve beer and we don't cash checks. She was plump in Waylands, and there were dark hollows under her eyes. There were coffee stains on her polyester pantsuit. Her companion now wore jeans and a t-shirt and a red baseball cap with a red and white Peterbilt patch. Coretti risked losing them when he spent a frantic mintent in pointers, blinking in confusion at a hand-littered cardboard sign that said, We aim to please you. Third Avenue lost itself near the waterfront in a petrified snarl of brickwork. In the last block, brightness marked the pavements at intervals, and the old men dozed in front of black and white TVs, sealed forever behind the fog plate glass of faded hotels. And the bar they found there had no name. An ace of diamonds was gradually flaking away on the unwashed window, and the bartender had a face like a close fist. An FM transistor and ivory plastic, keen, easy listening rock to the uneven ranks of deserted tables, and they drank beer and shots. And they were they were old now. Two ciphers who drank and smoked in the light of bare bulbs, coughing over a pack of crumpled camels she produced from the pocket of a dirty tan raincoat. At two twenty five, they were in the rooftop lounge of a new hotel. The rose above the waterfront. She wore an evening dress, and he wore all of a sudden a dark suit. And they drank cognac and pretended to admire the city lights. And they each had three cognacs. While Coretti watched them, over two ounces of wild turkey and a waterfront crystal highball glass. And they drank until the last call. And Coretti followed them into the elevator. They smiled politely, but otherwise ignored him. There were two cabs in front of the hotel, and they took one, Coretti the other. F follow the cab, said Coretti huskily, thrusting his last twenty at the angry hippie driver. Sure, man, sure. The driver dogged the other cab for six blocks to another more modest hotel. And they got out and they went in, and Coretti slowly climbed out of his cab, breathing hard. He ached with jealousy. For the personification of conformity, this woman who was not a woman, this human wallpaper, and Coretti gazed at the hotel and lost his nerve, and he turned away. And he walked home, sixteen blocks. At some point, he realized he wasn't drunk. Not drunk at all. In the morning... He phoned in to cancel his early class. But his hangover never quite came. His mouth wasn't desiccated, and staring at himself in the bathroom mirror, he saw that his eyes weren't bloodshot. In the afternoon, he slept. 
dream of sheep-faced people reflected in mirrors behind rows of bottles. And that night, he went out to dinner, alone, and ate nothing. The food looked back at him somehow. He stirred it about to make it look as if he'd eaten a little, paid and went to the bar, and another, and another bar, looking for her. He was using his credit card now, that was already badly in a hole with Visa. If he saw her, he didn't recognize her. Sometimes he watched the hotel he'd seen her go into. He looked carefully at each of the couples who came and went. Not that he'd be able to spot her from her look alone, but there should be a feeling, some kind of intuitive recognition. And he watched the couples, and he was never sure. In the following weeks, he systemically visited every boozy watering hole in the city, armed at first with a city map and five torn yellow pages. And he gradually progressed to the more obscure establishments, places with unlisted numbers. Some had no phone at all, and he joined dubious private clubs, discovered unlicensed after-hour retreats, where he brought your own sat nervously in dark rooms devoted to fringes that he had never known existed. But he continued on what became his nightly circuit. He always began at the back door. But she was never there, or in the next place, or the next. And the bartender knew him and they liked to see him come in, because he bought drinks and never seemed to get drunk. So he stared at the other customers a bit, so what? Coretti lost his job. He missed classes too many times. He'd taken to watching the hotels when he could, even in daytime. He'd been seen in too many bars. He never seemed to change his clothes. He refused night classes. He would let a lecture trail off in the middle as he turned to gaze vacantly out the window. He was secretly pleased at being fired. They had looked at him oddly at the faculty lunches when he couldn't eat his food, and now... He had more time for the search, and Coretti found her at 2.15 on a Wednesday morning in a bar called The Barn, paneled in rough wood and hung with halters and rustling farm equipment. The place was shrill with perfume and laughter and beer. She was everyone's giggling sister, a blue sequin dress a green feather and a coiffed brown hair. Through a sweeping sense of almost cellular relief, Coretti was aware of a kind of admiration. A strange tribe he now felt her in, and her kind. Here, too, she belonged. She was a representative of a type of person who posed no threat to the men there. Her companion had become an ageless man with carefully silver temples and a gora sweater and a trench coat. And they drank and they drank and went laughing and laughing. Just the right sort of laughter. Out into the rain, and a cab was waiting, and its wipers duplicating the beat of Coretti's heart. Jockeying clumsily across the wet sidewalks, Coretti scurried into the cab, dreading their reaction. Coretti was in the back seat beside her. The man with the silver temple spoke to the driver, and the driver muttered into his hand mic, changed gears, and they flowed away into the rain, darkened streets, and the cityscape made no impression on Coretti, who looked inwardly, was seeing the cab stop, and the gray man and the laughing woman pushing him out, pointless smiling to the gate of a mental hospital, or the cap just stopping and the couple turning, sadly shaking their heads, and a dozen times he seemed to see the cab stopping in an empty side train where they methodically throttled him, and Coretti left dead in the rain, because, well, he was an outsider. But instead, they arrived at Coretti's hotel. In the dim glow of the cab's dome light, He watched closely as the man reached into his coat for the fare. Coretti could see the coat's lining clearly, and it was one piece with the Angora sweater. No wallet budged there, and no pocket. 
but a kind of slit widened. It opens the man's fingers poised over it in a disgorged money. Three bills folded with extruded smoothly from the slit, and the money was slightly damp and it dried immediately as the man unfolded it, like the wings of a moth just emerging from the chrysalis. Keep the change, said the belonging man, climbing out of the cab, and Antoinette slid out and Coretti followed, his mind seeing only that slit, that slit wet, edged with red like a gill. And the lobby was deserted, and the desk clerk bent over a crossword. The couple drifted silently across the lobby and into the elevator, and Coretti close behind. Once he tried to catch her eye, but she ignored him. And once, as the elevator rose seven floors above Coretti's own, she bent over and sniffed at the chrome wall ashtray like a dog snuffling at the ground. And the hotels late at night are never still. The corridors are never entirely silent. There are countless, very audible sighs. The rustling of sheets, the muffled voices speaking fragments out of sleep. But in the ninth floor corridor, Coretti seemed to move through a perfect vacuum, soundless, his shoes making no sound at all on the colorless carpet, and even the beating of his outsider's heart sucked away into the vague pattern that decorated the wallpaper. He tried to count the small plastic ovals screwed on the door, each with its own three figures, but the corridor seemed to go on forever. At last, the man halted before the door. A door veneered like all the rest with imitation rose wood, and put his hand over the lock, his palm flat against the metal. And something scraped softly, and then the mechanism clicked, and the door swung open. And as the man withdrew his hand, Coretti saw a grayish pink key shaped sliver of bone retract wetly into the pale flesh. No light burned in that room, but the city's dim neon aura flittered in through Venetian blinds and allowed him to see the faces of the dozen or more people who sat perched on the bed, and the couch, and the armchairs, and the stools, and the kitchenette. At first, he thought that their eyes were open, but then he realized that the dull pupils were sealed beneath Nissitating membranes, three eyelids that reflected the faint shades of neon from the window. They wore whatever the last bard called for. Shapeless Salvation Army overcoats sat beside bright suburban leisure wear. Evening gowns beside dusty factory clothes, biker's leather by brushed hair's tweed. With sleep, all spurious humanity had vanished and they were roosting. His couple seated themselves on the edge of the Formica countertop in the kitchenette, and Coretti hesitated in the middle of the empty carpet. Light years of that carpet seemed to separate him from the others, but something called to him across the distance, a promising rest, and peace, and belonging. And still he hesitated, shaking with an indecision that seemed to rise from the genetic core of his body's every cell until they opened their eyes, all of them simultaneously, the membrane sliding sideways to reveal the alien calm of dwellers in the ocean's dark trench. Coretti screamed, and he ran away, and fled along the corridor, and down echoing concrete stairwells to cool rain and nearly empty streets. Coretti never returned to his room on the third floor of that hotel. A board house detective collected the linguistics texts, the single suitcase of clothing, and they were eventually sold at auction. Coretti took a room in a boarding house run by a grim Baptist tita toddler who led her room in prayer at the start of every overcooked evening meal. She didn't mind that Coretti never joined them for those meals. He explained that he was given free meals at work. He lied freely and skillfully. He never drank at the boarding house. He never came home drunk. Mr. Coretti was a little odd, but always paid his rent on time, and he was very quiet. 
Coretti stopped even looking for her. He stopped going to bars. He drank out of a paper bag while going to and from his job at a publisher's warehouse in an area whose industrial zoning permitted few bars. He worked nights, sometimes at dawn, perched on the edge of his unmade bed, drifting into sleep he never slept lying down. Now he thought of her, Antoinette and them, the belonging kind. Sometimes he speculated dreamily, perhaps they were like House mice, the sort of small animal evolved to live only on the walls of man-made structures. A kind of animal that lives only on alcoholic beverages. With peculiar metabolisms, they converted the alcohol and the various proteins from mixed drinks and wine and beer into everything they needed. And they can change outwardly, like a chameleon or a rockfish for protection. So, they can live among us. And maybe, Coretti thought... They can grow in stages. In the early stages, seeming like humans, eating the food humans eat, sensing the difference only in a vague disquiet of being an outsider, a kind of animal with its own cunning, its own special set of urban instincts, and the ability to know its own kind when they're near. But maybe that was all speculation. And maybe not. Coretti drifted into sleep. But on a Wednesday, three weeks into his new job, his landlady opened the door. She never knocked and told him that he was wanted on the phone. Her voice was tight with habitual suspicion, and Coretti followed her along the dark hallway to the second floor, sitting room, and the telephone. Lifting the old-fashioned black instrument to his ear, he heard only music at first, and then a wall of sound, resolving into a fragment of an amalgam of conversations and laughter. No one spoke to him over the sound of the bar, but the song in the background was the other reason our kids are ugly. And then the dial tone, when the caller hung up. And later, alone in his room, listening to the landlady's firm tread in the room below, Coretti realized that there was no need to remain where he was. The summon had come. But the landlady demanded three weeks' notice if anyone wanted to leave. That meant Coretti owed her money. Instinct told him to leave it for her. A Christian working man in the next room coughed in his sleep as Coretti got up and went down the hall of the telephone. And Coretti told the evening shift foreman that he was quitting his job. He hung up and went back to his room, locked the door behind him, and slowly removed his clothing until he stood naked before the garish framed lithograph of Jesus above the brown steel burrow. And then he counted out nine tens. He placed them carefully beside the praying hands plaque decorating the bureau top. It was nice looking money. It was perfectly good money. And he had made it himself. This time, he didn't like making small talk. She'd been a drinking margarita and he ordered the same. She paid, producing the money with a deft movement of her hand between the breasts bobbling the low-cut dress and he glimpsed the gill closing there. An excitement rose in him, but somehow, this time it didn't center in him. And after the third margarita, her hips were touching and something was spreading through him slow in waves. It was sticky where they were touching, an area the size of the heel of his thumb where the cloth had parted. And he was two men, the one inside fusing with her in total cellular communion, and the shell who sat casually on a stool at the bar, elbows on either side of his drink, fingers toying with a swizzle stick smiling benignly in the space, calm in the cool dimness. And once again, but only once, some distant worrisome part of him make ready glance down to where the soft ruby tubes pulsed, tendrils tipped with sharp lips worked in the shadows between them, like the joining tentacles of two anemones. They were together, and no one knew. And the bartender, 
brought the next drink, offered his tired smile, and said, Been raining out, isn't it? Yeah, it just won't let up. Been like that all week, Creddy answered, raining to beat the band. And he said it right, like a real human being.